Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Com Report wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. Don't forget you can read my work on ESPN.com. I have a story up now about why the commander's offense has been so good. Obviously, it's Jay Daniels. There's also the offensive line. There's also Cliff Kingsbury and the versatility of the offense, which I think will be needed this weekend, perhaps. So before I get into my five things, I think, and oh, by the way, if you want to become a club member, um, hit the, you know, go to the Empire Media YouTube page, click the word, click on the word join, go from there. Just for you YouTube members, um, for the members this week, I had a, an interview with um, our Cleveland, ESPN Cleveland Browns reporter. So just give you some insight into the game. Wasn't able to work that into the regular podcast this week, but I wanted to get those club members got that. So anyways, and next week, I'm, I'm hoping next week we have, a, another guest for those private Zoom sessions um, as well. So anyways, that aside, let's get to some injuries. Then I'm going to get to my five things, I think. So first, let's start with the injuries. Austin, running back Austin Eckler will play. He missed, of course, last week with the concussion, was cleared, and was not even listed on the injury on the game status report. So good to go. Now, um, two guys are out, Noah Brown, Cleveland Farrell. So Brown has a groin injury. Farrell still dealing with the knee injury. Now, last week, Dan Quinn was optimistic that he, that Farrell um, would, would turn this week. Not happening. He still doesn't say he doesn't need to go on IR, but he's going to miss three games a, a, at the very least. So I guess it still seems like he's going to be back soon. But anyways, not going to play this week. And then running back Brian Robinson, he is questionable because of his knee injury. Now, Robinson said that you know he, he feels better than he did at the beginning of the week. And whatever they list him at, whatever they're going to do, he's going to do. He obviously wants to play. He tweeted out something with a thumbs up emoji. Clearly, he feels okay, but I still think it's going to be a game time decision for Robinson. And if he can't go, then you got to bring up either Chris Rodriguez, who would be more kind of suited what he does, or Michael Wiley, right? So, and they obviously have Jeremy McNichols, but you don't want to go with a package of McNichols and Eckler for too long because you're going to want someone who can kind of you know, not get, you, you want a bigger back and, and neither of those guys, neither of those guys are big backs. So that's something to watch for. And then Nick Allegretti has the ankle injury could probably be a game time decision as well. He told me earlier in the week that he felt pretty good and that he would play, but you know, players often say that. So let's just see what happens on Sunday and then go from there. So um, Allegretti is a tough guy. He's a pretty good dude. If he can play, he's going to play but it may not be up to him. So, but as he even told me, I don't have to run fast. So it's an ankle injury. It's his right ankle. He got rolled up on in the game the other day. So anyway, that's some of the, that's what I know from that. And by the way, with, you know, with Brown out, it's a decent loss given that he's only been here three weeks, but he's caught nine passes, done a good job, really good blocker. That all helps, but they do have some versatility at that position. You go back to what Dan Quinn said before the season about, basically having a uh, number two receiver spot by committee. Well, this is part of what goes on here. So now you also have, you know, Zacchaeus can come in and step in. He did well last week. You have Deami Brown, you have Luke McCaffrey, who's done a nice job and he can block as well too. So, and so can Deami Brown. So there are, there are options there, but Brown has done a nice job. And, and I think, you know, but his, the hard part for Brown and he's got a groin injury, but the hard part for him has been over the years that he, just has a harder time staying healthy. So, but when he's out there, he does a good job. So anyways, let's get to my five things. So first of all, let's start with the up-tempo success. Nobody has run, nobody has run more plays in up-tempo, no huddle situations in Washington. In fact, it's like, I want to say it's like, I have this in my story on ESPN.com, but it's, it's all, it's not quite double what anybody else has done, but it's probably about 40 or 50 more than the number two team. So they've done it quite a bit. And you know, why is that? Well, first of all, it can create, you know, one of the things motion does is it regulates the defense and it gives you some clues as to what's going on. Well, you can do that with no huddle as well. I think the, the a key thing here is a couple of things. One, you have to have a quarterback who can operate this way and you do with Jaden Daniels. And he's got to be a good communicator. I think the line, the group has to be a good communicating group because if you don't, then you can get caught. But you also have to be ultra, ultra prepared. Because when you watch what they do, they do a lot of different formations. It's not like they just line up with three tight ends every time. They may run personnel in and out too. 
And so if you're doing that, you better have a good grasp on how to do this. And they do go over this a lot. One of the things Eckler told me earlier this week was he's never had as many walkthroughs as he has had here. And that's a philosophy that Cliff Kingsbury believes in because, as he said, when he was at Texas Tech, you do, you be in a meeting, you say, you got it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got it. I got it. Then they get out in the field and they don't have it. So rather than just doing that, he would bring them out in the field multiple times a day. So they're having at least three walks, walkthroughs a day at various times, just to make sure they've got things. And then in addition to that, you might see a practice, maybe um, somebody over on another side field doing their own personal walkthroughs. So like, for example, like you might see the quarterbacks doing that, but like, look at Jaden Daniels. This is what he does. He'll get in here. He'll get in the building. Like Kingsbury gets in here, you know, ridiculously early, probably around 4 a.m. Daniels will get here a little bit later, but those two will do their first walkthrough around 6 a.m. That's how you end up doing the up-tempo and being successful at it. So that's, you know, there have been times where we, I've seen Jaden Daniels, and I've tweeted this out, I've seen a video, video of it, and seen Jaden Daniels just doing his own after practice, kind of going through calls in up-tempo situations. I watched Sam Hartman do it during the rookie minicamp. You know, we know that Daniels would come in here and do it with Luke McCaffrey early and, you know, throughout the spring. So that's how you can run it successfully, but it starts with those, that kind of work and um, the emphasis that's put on it. So it allows them to be diverse in what they run because you cannot be diverse if you cannot handle those situations. And it's, it's always, I know in the past, there've been times like, why don't they do more of this? Well, cause not everybody can handle it, but you have a, a quarterback here who can. And I think the way things are taught in the situational football the emphasis on situational football has played a big part in this as well. I mean, they go over a lot of situational stuff, including in the up-tempo. So I think, you know, listen, when you're watching them, they never look confused in those situations. And that's a testament, testament, it's testament to the work they've put in to, to this point in that area. So big deal. And I think that's why, that's why it's working to this point. So the offensive line, they, they clearly have done a better job. Um, it's funny because we've talked about this and I, I kind of laugh now because you get some people and national people saying, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised. Like I thought they're gonna be horrible. Well, sometimes you can't just go by what somebody did last year. There's a lot of things that go into offensive line play a lot. And it, you know, it's, it's cohesion among a group. You can have five stand, you know, five. We saw this here with the defensive line, four number one picks, not cohesive, didn't work. So you can see the same thing with the offensive line. The Giants had a few number few first round picks it didn't work so why is it what is, is it being is it what's being taught is it the is it the scheme is it the quarterback sometimes it's a lot of all of that and i think we're seeing that here but the, one of the things they have going for them here is there is a good co it is a good cohesive group and bobby johnson the line coach um who was hired in the offseason said that one thing that helps is you've had got multiple guys who played together like Allegretti and Wiley played together in Kansas City. Cosme and Wiley together last year. Biadish and uh, Michael Dieter played together in college. So there is a familiarity that comes from that. And then you also have guys I think are just flat good communicators. Cosme's a really good guard. He and Biadish have certainly kind of meshed so far. So, and I think the same is true with um, Biadish and Allegretti as well. So that stuff all helps. And then um, I think another... Um, there are a couple other factors that have helped the offensive line. I think, again, the going to the cohesiveness, let's stay there. Every Thursday night, they're going out as a group. They go out to a different restaurant. Um, and <laughs> I was told by some of them, like, the, the plan is usually to make a, a reservation in a nice restaurant. They're not very organized that way, so they don't always do that. So one time they ended up at like five guys because they didn't, they had no reservation. They didn't know where to go. So they just went to five guys and they cleaned out. <laughs> I don't think they cleaned out the place necessarily, but they got a lot of burgers. I think, I think I would just say one offensive lineman had um, two of their burgers plus then what he considered a small burger, which is just a single. Because if you've had five guys, you know, it's double patties, double patties and cheese, whatever. And then the, the small one is just a single patty, but he told me he, like he didn't eat the fries. It just all it was just the the burger, the meat. That's good protein. So, but that's what they're doing. And but and he also didn't get the milkshake too. Which I will say this: Dorrance Armstrong and I agreed you get the milkshake. But this is what they're doing. The other night, they last night they went out to a wing or Thursday this Thursday night they went out to a wings place. A lot of wings, all you can eat. And it's funny because it's not like they're breaking the bank on these either. 
Um, but it's part of the group. It's part of building that bond as a group. And so that all matters. And then, you know, you look at for just from a football standpoint, what has helped? The scheme has helped. You know, there's a lot, the, the play action and the runs, the play action passes and the runs mirror each other. We've talked about that in, in the past, how that hasn't always been the case, but it is now. And you can see that. And it's why teams are biting on it. And that's a key this weekend. I'll get to that in a minute. So, and then the other part of that too is talking to one line. He's like, hey, part of it is Jaden Daniels' pocket presence and pocket movement is really, really good. That helps too. And there are linemen who would say, like, you know, this was this was going to be a sack on, on on him. And so like it's not. And so, but they know that at times Daniels has bailed them out. That's like, and and at times they bail Daniels out by, by, or they help him by blocking and picking up blitzes or whatever and giving him a shot. That's, that's how this works. And, you know, he can extend plays and that makes a big difference too. So all that stuff adds up, but it's why I think they're off to a good start. And it, it also helps like you watch the, you know, the run game is helped by the receiver blocking. That's always been the case. We talked about this in the summertime. I felt like that was a point of emphasis in the summertime. We're seeing it pay off here, but it's, you know, the, the ends or the, excuse me, the tight ends, the um, sometimes the backs, sometimes the receivers, they're all chipping the end. So I would expect more of that this week because they've been doing it every week and it helps the tackle. If the tackle knows that you're doing that, they set accordingly. The problem comes when if somebody doesn't know that they're you're going to chip an end, and then you do it, it might push the end into a, the defensive player into a better spot to beat the tackle. So anyways, there you go with that. But all of it adds up. And it's funny because like Bobby Johnson, their line coach, is a guy that, you know, he came, came highly recommended from Brian Dable, who fired him in New York. So it tells you probably not Dable's decision to fire him. And um, but so far, it's worked out well here. And he's he has a hand in the run game. Um, and you know, the whole thing is developing guys. And I think, um, Darnell Stapleton, their assistant line coach has a good reputation for doing just that. So a lot of things that have gone into, to, um, helping them out. So. Hey, it's Bram Weinstein here, voice of the commanders. And of course, frequent guest of this podcast, the John time report. I wanted to let you all know that my show, which airs at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on ESPN 630, is now exclusively produced by Empire Media, my company, and is going to be distributed through our network. So I'm asking you, please, if you subscribe to this show and love this show, give mine a try as well. Subscribe to The Bram Weinstein Show wherever you get your podcasts. And many of the shows and many of the elements that are in the show will be available on the Empire Media YouTube channel. We're going to talk a ton of commanders and other DC sports. Check it out. The other thing is, number, you know, another point is, I guess, number three is just talking about, I guess I meant to make, make, make Dayball number three, because I think that matters. But also, like, you look at guys, another thing that helps align is Cornelius Lucas and Brandon Coleman. They're splitting time. Nobody really wants to split time. Everybody wants to be out there, but they're making it work. And I think that's indicative of how this group is is thinking and how the overall team has been behaving is, you know, for the looking big picture with this with the team. Now, we'll see what happens. Now, when you're winning, you're going to accept things. This is why, like even last year, there are guys who would have accepted the way the enemy was toward them if they had been winning, because when you're winning, it's like, well, it's working. But when it's not, when you're not winning and it's not working, then you start to get annoyed. So, but so far, you know, they've done the, the they're using Lucas and Coleman and yeah, they'd like to have one guy ascend, but both, they seem to feel that both are playing well and both can help them. Therefore, it's, it feels like it will continue. So they're not going to tell us that it isn't, but you know, they've been pleased with how both players have handled that. It helps that Lucas has been a backup. Now, this is a good chance for him. It helps that Coleman's a rookie who missed a lot of camp. Now, if he had missed all that camp, it's very likely that he would have been starting all along. But he did, and Lucas has not done enough to warrant not starting him. So that helps. Now, they're, they're going to be, both those guys at some point will be matched up against Miles Garrett on Sunday. I'll get to Miles Garrett in a minute. So, But I do think like that's also indicative of what is going on in the building. And it, as long as you're winning, 
players typically will say like, hey, we're winning, then we'll do this. So that's a big factor and that's what they're doing now. So it's all good. And, you know, it's funny because the other, the other thing for that group is they were obviously very much maligned and especially a guy like Andrew Wiley. He was, cru- you know, getting crushed last year by, and he didn't play well. But, the, but again, I always go back to scheme, et cetera, and they did not put him in a good spot. This year, I think they are. And what you're seeing from Wiley this year is more of what he can do. He can, he can help you in the run game, and he can help you out in space. So, you, yes, you have – there might be more of an issue here, but he's helping here and here. And I think when – so you look at the total, the total package, and it's working. Now, we'll see what happens on Sunday because, again, very good pass rusher. And Garrett, when he's matched up against him, Darius Smith is also a pass rusher who can match up against him, and he's got to be careful because he gets – but where he has the hard time is blocking – you know, getting – letting guys get inside – but he's also doing other things to help because they're doing more to highlight what other, not just if they're not running the ball. So Andrew Wiley can help him, but by running the ball more and doing some other things, you're seeing what that he can help you in other ways when maybe he's not the best pra- pass protector at left at right tackle, but he can help you as a run blocker. He can help you out in space. So there you go. Anyways. So let's get to the wide receivers because all this ties together to help the wide receivers. And we were talking to Terry McLaurin about this and about like, well, because the line is doing a better job protecting over on for whatever reason, whatever you want to credit, whether it's a quarterback who, you know, gets rid of the ball quicker, whether it's a scheme, whether it's whatever it is, but sometimes they're just blocking well. So what does the impact on the, on the receivers? And there's not only that, and I'm going to mix it with Jaden Daniels accuracy because he's highly accurate. Again, it's not about completion percentage. It's about where he's putting the ball. Like you can, you can complete a pass, but if you're not putting on the proper shoulder, giving the guy to turn, well, yeah, it's a completion, but maybe it's your one for one for five yards. A guy who's accurate might be one for one for 10 yards. That's the difference. So anyways, with, with the offensive line play, what's the trickle down effect on the receivers. McLaurin was saying, telling us that it, sometimes in the past when you knew when you knew that the quarterback might have trouble holding up behind the line they would, that he wouldn't have enough time to get it downfield you may run your routes too fast so you're running it at a different pace to try and do things and maybe you don't do something because of it maybe you can't throw in a double move because of it maybe you can't do a stem because of it because you know if you don't get down there as fast as you can guys got no chance to get it off so that's one thing and then with the other thing is with with um, the accuracy, kind of along with that, and it's funny because I was talking to Tavita Pritchard about this, a quarterbacks coach. How does the accuracy? Well, obviously the accuracy. And McClellan was saying like it's just what it does is too is it lets you know like you don't have to give up ground. Like you can you can maintain your route because you know that Daniels is going to put the ball where it needs to be. You know that he's going to lead you into where you need to turn, so you can trust what he's throwing to you. So. If you're if he's thrown to you on your left shoulder and you're running out to the left, you know that's where you're going into. If he throws it to your back shoulder, you know you probably have to turn inside. Things like that. Now, sometimes, like the throw to Terry McLaurin last week on the third and two, well, that's coming off your back foot and drifting. Accuracy there is just completing the damn pass and you get a first down because you're drifting back, et cetera. But one of the things, too, that Tavita Pritchard was saying with the accuracy that it does allow the receivers. I just said they don't have to run as fast. He said, but it does allow them to run faster because they know if they get to where they need to be, that he's going to get in the ball to get them yards after the catch and get where you need to be at the time you need to be there because that also leads to better accuracy. So that all helps as well. So, um, but there's a big, big benefit that you get from 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 that for sure. And by the way, you know, I was it's funny because I was talking to Pritchard about it too. That pass to McCaffrey last week was a tremendous pass under duress because it wasn't like the accuracy comes like usually if you can get your feet around, there's some clean pockets. There are examples of that where you, okay, you get your feet, you know, you can be accurate. But how are you accurate in a messy pocket? Well, it's because like for Daniels, sometimes he can get outside the pocket, the Noah Brown third 13, or the one to McCaffrey where you can just get your feet are both pointed straight. You're not getting your front foot out to him because you can't, but you got both feet pointing in the right direction. And then it's just a torque of your upper body. That's just all torque. But that is an impressive throw in that situation and an highly accurate throw as well. So anyways, um, there you go. That's all I got on that one. And then now let's go to the 
Cleveland. Let's go to Cleveland, right? Okay, because in this couple of things. One, I think this is as anticipated a game that this team has had in a long time, especially for early in the year. And just because it's a chance, like you know the fan base, you know how you guys are feeling. The players are excited for this game. Like they've been getting, you know, tickets. I don't know. I'm assuming it's going to be a sellout. Um, I do anticipate, a, I don't know how many Browns fans will be there, but I, what I know is there are a lot of Browns fans in the Washington area. There's a lot of Cleveland fans in the Washington area. So I do anticipate, and they probably bought tickets a long time ago. So you may get a contingent of that. I don't know how big it will be, but I do expect a really, really good atmosphere for, for the commanders. And because I think people should be excited, whether, whatever they do this year, they're becoming a fun team to watch. And that stems from the offense and number five, and then I think the the building continue will continue on the defensive side, and they're just going to continue on offense too. But you you know I think the ability to or the fact that you have a young quarterback who is exciting, who looks like he know he looks like he could be really good for a long time. That's got that's got to be so exciting. And whether or not they go on and win the division this year, or they go eight and nine, or whatever they do, you got your guy. And I think that has certainly energized this fan base. I think we'll see it reflected on Sunday. I can tell you the players, the coaches, they've been talking about that, looking forward to what the atmosphere is going to be like on Sunday. So now with the Browns, um, they're struggling. They're one and three, a couple plays, and they're three and one. A couple plays, one or two plays against the Giants. They they are driving for a late score. They, they don't get it. You know, they're driving for a late score against the Raiders. They don't get it. And part of what didn't help is that um, former Washington kicker, Dustin Hopkins, missed an extra point earlier in the game. Had to go, they were inside there at like the 20 yard line, inside the 20 late in the game. Had to go for a fourth down to the Kingdom field goal. But, you know, they're, so the point is they're close to being three and one, but they're not playing well enough to be three and one. And some of that, let's, so let's take a look at, first of all, the defense, because the defense can still, is still, can be very effective. I think this will be a really good test for Washington's offense for a couple of reasons. One, you have some, you have a, one of the best pass rushes in the NFL in Miles Garrett. How are they going to handle him? And how is, how, you know, what's he, because he's he's not just strong, he's fast. And then you have, you know, he, he can do everything. You watch his spin moves, watch everything. He's going to move around. He will play. At times, they're going to line up as a defensive tackle. So he's going to line up as one lineman said, all five guys are going to have to face him at some point. So that's the expectation there. And then you have uh, um, uh, Jeremiah Usu koromoa Guy that I thought they should have take, t- taken here because he can play. Not a big guy, but man, is he fast and man, does he attack. And he is really good at avoiding blocks, not just running around them, but avoiding them on, on his path to the running back. That front seven is really, really aggressive, really aggressive. So they are trying to, they, and one thing is someone here told me, like, not only are they aggressive, they're really good at filling gaps and getting to their gap. So they they can stop the run, but if you you block it right, you're going to hit them a little bit. Now you're, they're just as capable of getting you for a two or three yard loss as the, as you are getting for a seven or eight yard run because of the way they penetrate. Now Washington has had I think it's what five negative plays combined the last two games. That's a big reason for their success against the Giants. They had twelve. And they had a few too many in the red zone, including the penalties. So that's that was a why they what this twelve negative plays. They still got four hundred twenty-five yards. It's kind of incredible, um, but it explains why they only had twenty-one points. So the Browns are really good in that area. So a couple of things that I've noticed and in, in talking to, in watching the film and then noticing it ta- or talking to guys, they're susceptible to the play action pass, especially some play action inside digs and slants, whatever. So you know if you're McLaurin. You should be, that's something he does well. So look for that. Now, Denzel Ward will cover him, I'm assuming. Denzel Ward might, those two play to get played together at Ohio State. So they are very familiar with each other. He might be the best corner that McLaurin faces all year. And so that's going to be a chance for him. He's a very patient, physical. So that's going to be some a really good matchup to watch. But I think that play action pass game will be an issue. And then along with that in the run game are traps. Look for a lot of traps, perhaps, because I think that's one way they can get things um, moving in the ground game. And then the other guy, Martin Emerson, he's I'm not sure if he's even going to play, but if he does, he's a guy that, you know, he can he can be a good corner. But, th- but there's a tendency sometimes 
If you make some plays early, more in the game, all game. If you're not making plays early, then or if you give up a couple plays early, maybe you lose your head a little bit. So see how see how he reacts to whatever he does early and see where it goes from there. But you know, I think you can use that aggressiveness against them. The I've seen other teams do it, but it's not like they're scoring a ton of points on them, but they are having success in at those times. And you can run on them a little bit. Um, but I think it's more it's more some outside stuff and then traps. But again, Cuomo is a really is a is a really fast, quick, decisive player. But they want to play fast in that front. And safeties have just been okay. Um, so I, you know, um, see what happens there. But this is a good challenge for this offense for a lot of reasons. You're missing Noah Brown, but also like they're going to throw some different things at you. But also Miles Garrett and then Cuomo a combo. That's a lot of speed out there. And and Garrett's Garrett is as, pretty much as good as they come at that position. So how do they handle that? And then what do they do? How does Jaden Daniels handle that? You got to protect the ball in the pocket. And that's just, they're not just throwing a pick, but more so fumbles. You cannot afford that in this game. The Browns are struggling. Let, you know, they, they've actually, you know, funny thing is like, they've done a pretty good job on their first drive in every game. They're not a very good team after that on offense. So don't give them openings for some early success to get some early momentum. So offensively with the Browns, you know, they're still, that's, I mean, it hasn't been good. And Deshaun Watson is still trying to find his way. I would say last week against the Raiders and when, you know, um, for you club members, you would have heard my interview that that may have been his best game with the Browns in a while. Um, but they only scored 16 points. And part of that is they had a touchdown call back, an 82-yarder call back to Mark Cooper. And, not, and the only pick that he threw in that game was a ball that bounced right off Cooper's chest and into the arms of the defender. And so, like, it would have been at the 32. It would have gone down, and I think they would have – I think they are only down three or something like that at the time. Um, bottom line is it really hurt them, and it cost them. And so, like, they can't afford this kind of place. Cooper has not had a good year. He's a still – he can be a very good receiver. He was last year. And then you have Jerry Judy who can make some plays. And then David Njuku, their tight end, I don't know that he's going to play. So by the time this comes out, you may already know. It may be a game-time decision, but he's been dealing with some, I think it's an angle issue. But um, And their awesome offensive line has also had multiple health issues. I also feel like losing Bill Callahan was a tremendous loss for that offensive line because he's as good as they come as an offensive line coach. The injuries haven't helped. Their, expe their starting center ex is expected to be back this week. But the question is, will the tackles be back? And they, they've been out too. So they had three offensive linemen that were out against the Raiders. Will they be back this week? There's a chance that all three could, but I don't know that for sure. So you, you want to check check Twitter, check you know ESPN, whatever you want to do. But that's you know that's something to watch because when they're not there, that's not a very good line. And they've had some issues for Deshaun Watson. Like if they had their line, they, again they could be three and one. So. You cannot take this as a as a W automatically just because the Browns are one and three. There have been factors involved in that, and I think some of those factors, like is it getting better for them, and is it they're not are they far away? You know, I think one of the hard things with their offense is they have a quarterback who's better off schedule. He can still make some plays off schedule. He did that. The Amari Cooper touchdown was off schedule. Again, just called back because of a holding penalty, which probably would have impacted the play. So, but it, but bottom line is he was able to, he did show that he can still make plays in the move. Um, and he made a couple other ones that way. But you have a guy who's that way in a timing-based offense under Coach Kevin Stefanski. They hired Ke Ken Dorsey as the OC in the offseason to help with that, but they're not having him call the plays. It's kind of an odd mix, to be honest. So Watson's strength is not staying in rhythm. And I think you need to try and disrupt that rhythm a little bit or, you know, or keep them that way, but keep them in the pocket because I think then you can really, when you, when you keep them in the pocket, things change for him. So if Washington's defensive line, because they did a better job pressuring, they did a better job containing Kyler Murray, they continue on that way, then they're better off. But my goodness, man, if you can't, they've got to stop the run this week. And the Browns are, Nick Chubb will not be back this week. So, you know, that's, it's not a strength of the Browns right now because really I don't even know that they have an offensive strength. I don't think they have an offensive identity. When Chubb gets back, I think that becomes their identity. He's not there. So this is an offense that the, this defense needs to take advantage of. You cannot let it get some momentum because I think this will be a bigger challenge for Washington's offense. And you don't want to, you know, you don't want to um, 
give give an opening to the, to the Browns um, Browns offense at all. So anyway, folks, that's it for me. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Hope you get something out of those five things. And I'll be back. You know, I listen. My own take on this game. I mean, you have to like Washington. I just think this is a dangerous game, not because it's a trap game, but because it's a game against a team that's one and three. That if they get some of their guys back, will be a will be in a better spot to pull off a win. But you know, I'll be honest. Like following this team and what there's just something different about them that I think in the past we know that teams have laid a big egg at home in these situations. You know, but this is a better coach team with better cohesion and a better quarterback. So I think that that I think will pay off on Sunday. Anyways, that's it for me. I'll be back after the game on Sunday, wrapping up the Commanders Browns game. So thanks folks for tuning in. I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>